Hey all, it's David Ducker coming back at you. And today I'm going to be talking about Lizard Folk. Lizard Folk are probably my second favorite race. Uh, let's start out by talking about the history of Lizard Folk in my setting. So in my setting, once upon a time, dragons ruled over the world. And uh, they enslaved all of the other races to worship them. Eventually, they created kind of a middle caste by interbreeding with their slaves. So half dragons, who did most of the actual running of their empire, this middle class of half dragons eventually overthrew the dragons themselves and formed their own civilization. Uh, and this is kind of the proto lizard folk. These are the people who would eventually evolve into modern day lizard folk in my game. In many areas, the slaves overthrew them. Uh, in many other areas, the slaves uh, have not yet done so and, and continue to be enslaved, as is their one custom. I think we all know approximately what lizard folk look like. Uh, I do try to add on different uh, horn types to them, different crests, uh, different frills and spikes uh, to kind of differentiate families and differentiate even different city-states. But I think we all basically know what lizard folk look like. Um, so lizard folk in my game live in the jungles uh, and they're very much based on Mesoamerican cultures. So they create these enormous walled cities deep in the jungle. And they have uh, step pyramids dominating the skyline of their cities. They're somewhat uh, theocratic. And they tend to worship uh, serpent deities or occasionally dragon deities, such as Quetzalcoatl, uh, Kukulkin, uh, Yig, the father of serpents, uh, could even could even work them in with some Egyptian mythos and get uh, get Apep in there. Um, other races could view them as worshiping things like Jormungandr, the world serpent, or uh, things like Typhon from Greek mythology, uh, the the father of of serpents, the father of dragons in Greek mythology, or even the Hydra. Although, you might even just take a Hydra and they just worship Hydras, because Hydras will fit very well into that jungle environment. So, I typically run them with religion being very, very important to them. Uh, blood sacrifices, especially of their slaves, very, very important to them. You know, sacrificing them up on the temple, pulling out the heart, cutting off the head, throwing the body... Uh, down the pyramid steps, so it just falls down and rolls down. You know, throwing the head down the pyramid steps, and they catch it in an enormous basket. Uh, if you ever seen Mel Gibson's Apocalypto, uh, that's a great, great scenes of sacrifice, human sacrifice in there. Uh, and just just watch that movie in general, just because it's a great movie. But uh, I definitely base them off that Mesoamerican culture, the blood sacrifice. I tend to, to, if I'm running Pathfinder, I, I tend to lean towards either clerics with the animal domain or uh, just go straight druid so they can uh, transform into other serpentine creatures, giant snakes, hydras, dinosaurs, etc., uh, even dragons. Um, also, you know, give them those animal companions because lizard folk in my games, apart from ogres, uh, lizard folk tend to be the masters of, of uh, animal breeding and training. So they'll have uh, you know troops riding out on triceratops, uh, riding out on brontosauruses with castles of, of bamboo built on their back, just filled with archers or siege engines, um, riding out with their regular cavalry on the backs of uh, Deinonychus, or uh, Mega Raptors, or, or Tyrannosaurus, in fact. So, uh, I, or, you know, just uh, giant monitor lizards. So I really tend to push them as the, the masters of animal husbandry. Uh, the greatest riders in the world are lizard folk in my game. 
Uh, so I'm trying to push them as druids or rangers and get an animal companion or a cleric with the animal domain, get the animal companion in there for them. Uh, or even if they're going arcane, uh, ho hook them up with uh, wizards with the familiars that are lizards or snakes. Uh, actually, I think there's a cleric domain, it's serpent kind. Uh, or you could hook them up with sorcerer with the arcane domain and then they still get a familiar or just go straight draconic sorcerer. There's a lot of great options for them uh, in Pathfinder. But you'll be able to find similar options in pretty much any system. Uh, so I tend to run them definitely. Masters of Cavalry, Master, Masters of Mounted Combat. Uh, get them in there riding their dinosaurs uh, as much as possible. Uh, I also tend to push them as uh, pretty strong hunters because of that affinity with nature. So they have great stealth. They're moving among the jungle. I get them with some poison uh, blow darts, uh, if I can. Bows, javelins. Uh, I love the obsidian swords as well. As well. Uh, so I try to get them in with obsidian swords for their melee weaponry, wicker shields, or the classic turtle shell shields uh, for their melee. But uh, their government is largely uh, theocratic, so the, the high priests of Quetzalcoatl or whichever uh, serpent deity they worship, that's going to be the leader of their civilization. Uh, you know, they might have a king as well, but uh, but definitely the, the power behind the throne is going to be the, the theocracy there. Um, and because of that hunting uh, background, we also get a great opportunity for traps to come into play. You get rogues in there with simple traps, uh, pit traps, snares, etc. Uh, so that can come in. Uh, jewelry, fair, fairly important for them. Uh, they quite enjoy jewelry, body paint as well. Um, although they don't, you know, they don't wear a tremendous amount of clothing. But jewelry is very important to them. And they might even wear like a, a loincloth or, or a robe, a vestment, something like that. But uh, typically uh, jewelry is going to be their, their primary form of clothing. Uh, in terms of food, uh, one great thing you can do with lizard folk is highlight their metabolism. Because lizards you know, work on a different uh, metabolic cycle than warm-blooded creatures do. So they might only need to eat uh, once every two weeks and they'll gorge themselves and then they'll be sluggish for uh, several days or, t or, or usually I break it down that they eat, they're sluggish for a week and then they get, uh, then they get about uh, one or two weeks of activity and then they have to eat again. And they might, they might snack in between this or they might snack to kind of extend their period of activity before they need to gorge again. When they gorge, it needs to largely be on just raw meat. And all their snacks is where their regular cuisine comes into play, uh, which I base largely on uh, uh, South American cuisine or Mexican cuisine. Uh, since they have corn, tomatoes, hot peppers, they use a lot of those ingredients, uh, beans as well. Um, in my game, I don't usually have any European uh, analogy, have access to New World foods like potatoes, tomatoes, vanilla, chocolate, hot peppers. So you're not going to see uh, taters in my Lord of the Rings game or uh, boiled potatoes in my Game of Thrones game. I'm going to try to keep it more, more authentic, uh, just for my own enjoyment, really. But... Uh, that can bring us into uh, why uh, lizard folk would interact with the other races would be to trade for these things. So, you know, the, the European analogs uh, might want some chocolate, some vanilla, some hot peppers, tomatoes, potatoes, and they can trade with the lizard folk for these things. Because the lizard folk have this advanced society, they're not barbarians. So they can get this great trade opportunity in and, and have them be just this exotic other race. Great thing about lizard folk is they don't have to be uh, good or evil. They can be very neutral. Whereas a goblin, an ogre, uh, they are somewhat evil. Although that you can still work with them, but you've got to keep an eye on them. Where lizard folk, uh, much more neutral. 
so they can they can fulfill a great role there. Um, actually, their cold bloodedness uh, that can get brought in as well. Make them sluggish in cold weather. Uh, make them more active in hot weather. Have them complain that it's too cold, even when everyone else, all the mammals, think it's fine. But but for lizard folk, they like it pretty hot. Uh, you can bring in other biological differences, like their ability to see closer to infrared, or the fact that they smell with their tongues uh, flicking in and out of their mouth. Uh, so you can bring that in, just even while you're talking, just just bring your tongue in and out, and, and just kind of remind people that, that you're actually a lizard that they're talking to. So that can be a lot of fun. Um, I usually play them as somewhat arboreal, so they have pretty strong climbing ability as well in my game. Uh, so you can really, and, and good swimming ability too. So they're very, very athletic kind of creatures. Uh, e even when they're more sedentary, like a high priest, you know, they're still better at climbing and swimming than a normal human would be. Uh, and you can get them to hold their breath for an extended period. I love to bring in an ability where they can spit venom like a king cobra. Uh, that's a great ability, you know, that they can spit it into someone's eyes and blind them. Uh, it's not really useful for much else, it's, so it's not an incredibly useful ability, but it adds a lot of flavor when they can do that. Uh, or even, I've seen where some of them, you know, they they can uh, they can just lick their blade, they can uh, secrete poison out of their fangs into their mouth, slosh it around in their mouth, and then lick their blade and uh, use that as, as their weapon. Uh, I love the idea of bringing them in with a lower tech level, like I said, with obsidian swords. Um, but if you do give them other weapons, I would only bump it up a little. So give them some stone maces uh, or give them some bronze maces or bronze, uh, uh, maybe a kopesh made of bronze. So that you keep them at a lower tech level than all the other races. It makes them unique. And it kind of highlights that their resources in the jungle are very different. They're metal poor, but they're very, very rich in wood and very rich in meat and animals, of which uh, certain areas, you know, that might be a big deal. Uh, especially like compared to an ogre, ogres have very little agriculture. Uh, so the fact that lizard folk can just gather fruit off the trees and just eat you know that's to an ogre that's that's astounding because ogres kind of have built their whole society around making sure that there is some food that they have access to because they live in the tundra so the contrast between an ogre and a lizard folk if they were ever to meet uh, would just be huge and uh, that could be a great role-playing scene as well um, so I, I also make uh, lizard folk tremendously competitive against each other. So their societies uh, are lawful to a certain degree, but they're also very competitive. So every year they have a big kind of festival where they all uh, will gather together and all the males will uh, compete against each other for the attention of the females. This festival coincides with when the females all go into heat. So all the females in the city go into heat at the same time. The men pretty much gather in the town square, which are enormous squares, you know, beneath the pyramids, and they compete against each other, bragging about their battle prowess and dueling each other, uh, hopefully non-lethally, uh, dueling against each other to try to attract females to them. And uh, you can even do a little bit with the same thing with the females, where the females will kind of say, okay, you know, I'm I'm a high priestess, I need a good man, uh, you know, I need a great warrior, a great hunter, what, you know. And then some some the females will come through and say, oh, I'm, I'm you know, I'm just kind of a, a gatherer in the forest, so I, I, I can settle for, you know, a less virile male. So all the females will kind of gather, and they're already, kind, they've kind of ranked each other, so they're kind of jostled for position a little bit, but the males are really hyper-competitive against each other. 
So there's this great idea that, first of all, there's no real mating during most of the year. Once a year, big mating festival. You know, it's, it's almost can turn into like an orgy in the sense that once they pair off, they might start mating immediately in public. And at this festival, that's fine. That's just the way their society is. But they won't be passing that female around or sharing her. They'll be fiercely defending against other males. And, uh, you know, they'll all pair off and they could all start mating at the same time in the festival uh, in the town square. So for an outsider, that can be just really weird. It's so different from what mammals do, you know. And also just that most of the year, I mean, they, they, it doesn't even matter if they're male or female. They look pretty much alike. Uh, you know, the, they can probably only tell each other apart in terms of gender just by scent. So they look pretty much alike even to each other, they might. Uh, and it really contrasts that they're a little more animalistic and they're just so different from a mammal uh, in their habits. Uh, so, but, but this kind of jostling for position, it, it makes them extremely hyper competitive against each other all year long because they want to be that, that top dog at all times. You know, even the females, they want they want to be the top dog. It's just they'll, they'll compete more in a more civilized manner against each other females. So I, I love that idea that, you know, human beings can get along with each other pretty well and uh, compromise. Where lizard folk, it, it's intense for them. They're not going to compromise. They're hyper aggressive alpha male at all times. Uh, and if you don't get in their way of doing that, they're fine. But if you do, a whole other side of their personality can come out. So I, I love that aspect. Um, so in terms of like once the females have been impregnated, they'll lay their brood uh, at their home. And they'll, they'll, they'll essentially keep track of like which uh, children belong to which male. And they'll... they'll they will, to a degree, uh, seek out the male for help in, in raising and taking care of them and rearing them. But the next year, you know, they'll, they'll have a new uh, male and, and he'll kind of be responsible for his children uh, or child. I, th I think I might, if they're, if they're breeding every year, we might only cut it down to that they, they only lay like one egg every year as well. Uh, just, just it'll just make things a lot easier in that regard. But they kind of they raise the child together, but in separate homes, and the 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 children kind of live typically at the female's home. Um, so we have this very interesting society where it's so interwoven that a female might have five children, and they're each with five different males. Uh, so that creates a really weird and really interesting uh, social dynamic in that they don't breed for life. They don't mate for life. Uh, so they might not even have this concept of love uh, the way a mammal would, the way that you know we, we mate for life typically. So we have so much of our culture dedicated towards love and romance. Whereas lizard folk would have none of that. They, they might have a lot of lust, but they can only really express uh, or, or maybe even feel their lust uh, just during that one time of the year anyway. So what this would do to their art and culture is very interesting. Uh, you know, so this would really push them more towards secular activities and more towards uh, you know, religious activities. So lizard folk are not sentimental in that regard. They don't have this kind of affection for each other. So they can come across as very cold, uh, very kind of callous, uh, which, which again, just contrasts them against the other races. They might be a nice guy, you know, he's lawful good, he's, he's very uh, responsible, and, uh, uh, you know, he doesn't like cheat or lie or steal, but he's so cold and uh, competitive can come across very, very selfish. I mean, it is very selfish. They'll look after themselves. They'll look after their children, their direct children. 
but that's kind of just to establish their own legacy, their own line. So even doing that, they can be very selfish in, in that sense. So again, great contrast against the other races. Um, just think, just think if there's anything else I miss. I do food, shelter, uh, clothing, government, uh, military, which is the uh, dino riding. Uh, I think that that's probably it for the lizard folk. I'm trying to think if there's anything else biologically that I might have missed. Uh, because the biology is always very interesting to me, playing uh, any kind of alien. Uh, but I think that pretty much covers everything. So that's that's how I run lizard folk. They're the masters of the jungle. They have these city states. They're in competition with each other. All the individuals are in competition with each other. They're united by religion. They're united by nationalism, and that each city state is very proud. Uh, but they're very alien from humankind. It doesn't make them evil. Uh, it just makes them another race to play with and to throw into your sandbox. So that's all I got to say about the lizard folk. Uh, let me know what you think of this idea. Let me know what you do with lizard folk, because uh, I'd love to hear it. And hopefully you'll look forward to uh, future race videos from me. Uh, great contrast with lizard folk would be the uh, bullywug. Uh, so I'm not sure if I'll do that next or what I'll be doing next, but uh, I still got a lot more to record, so look forward to it. Cheers.